Ladies and gentlemen, Andrea James. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie and Wade and all of uh, RFK. Thank you, Mrs. Kennedy, for this incredible honor uh, to stand with you, uh, to stand in the legacy of your husband, and to be invited into the RFK family to do this work is an incredible honor for us. And I thank you very much. I thank you for creating a space for the voices of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women and girls, and for helping the world to understand that we have a voice and that our voice needs to be heard. And it's incredible that you have that vision, Mrs. Kennedy, to know the importance of raising the voices of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women and girls. And I thank you. I wanna first just do something that's very important and uh, my comments will be brief, but I do wanna take the time to thank my family. Uh, my family, um, I come from incredible people incredible people. My parents are here with me today, um, and I was very fortunate. And I stand before you today, I'm sure, because of my parents, the history of their work, their struggle and their fight within the civil rights movement, and their purpose to make sure, Mrs. Kennedy, that we understood what your husband was speaking about. We understood it because my parents were of that community that were standing up to demand civil rights on behalf of people. And so I'm incredibly honored to have my parents sitting before me today. Thank you. Of course, I could not do this work. Um, I'm, I pretty much live out of a suitcase, and uh, there is no way that I could uh, do this work without the support of my husband, who made sure when I left my five-month-old baby boy in the parking lot of the prison in Danbury, Connecticut, my 12-year-old daughter and my other daughter uh, who is here and our other daughters at home, that um, it was incredibly important to see my children. And my husband traveled three hours back and forth, three hours to the prison, three hours back from the prison, every single opportunity that I had to have a visit. My husband brought my children to see me. And he continues to create that space in our home so that I can do this work. And I love you and I thank you for that. So as you've heard, uh, Congressman Booker and, and, and Kerry remind us that our work is really cut out for us. For women in this space doing this work, if you add misogyny to that mix, if you also add a women's movement that in the history of the women's movement in this country has pretty much ignored the voices of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women and girls and the effect on incarceration of those women and girls, on our children and communities. If you add that all to the mix of the bag of barriers we face daily, it's quite a challenge to continue to advance our agenda. Even during the recent more receptive times, those of us working in the space of decarceration have been doing so against great odds all along. 
we still have been doing it against great odds, even in these more receptive times. We shall continue to connect ourselves and collaborate, and we shall not, in these more difficult times again, be deterred. I want to say to Mr. Martin, Glenn, it's an honor to be here with you. It's an honor to work in this space with you, and I thank you for your commitment to our community and to our people, and I love you, Glenn. Thank you. So as we traverse these uncertain times, we must do so with the awareness that we have moved again through uncertain times before. As before, we shall continue the fight to end separations of mother, separation of mothers from children. We will continue to fight the end of unfair conspiracy laws, voter disenfranchisement, and to regain the more than six million votes that could not be cast in this last election. We will fight to continue to end incarceration, whether in a government prison or a private prison, and to continue the push for increase in access to education for incarcerated people. We will continue to demand oversight of the treatment of our people, transparency and, our, and connectivity between those forced to live in a prison and their families and community on the outside. And from within our neighborhoods, we shall continue to work toward the true intent of justice reinvestment as defined by the communities most affected to shift from a criminal legal system to one focused on human justice and investment in the health and well-being of people and communities. Going forward as the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, it is our responsibility to use this uncertain time as opportunity to continue the convening of women to work toward collective, radical, forward movement that addresses the needs and concerns of all people. There is a power in a sisterhood that has at its core respect for one another based on our shared experience of incarceration as women. The bond of women who have lived in a prison together is strong. To use that bond as a starting place to create an agenda for the advancement of the lives of women and our communities, an agenda addressing the needs of the most vulnerable women and girls in the country, and to use that agenda to form policy. When you do that, you really, truly understand the meaning of justice reinvestment, and you begin to heal and advance people. And within that sisterhood, we provide the safe space in difficult, uncertain times to dig deep into the places of fear and pain and hold each other accountable to maintaining healing at the forefront of how we do our work. We understand that staying on task to end incarceration of women and girls requires us to confront the realities of our individual experiences and beliefs and not shy away from the things that are at the root of this country's racism, treatment of poor and working people, and the treatment of women and girls. Without this critical phase of healing, there is no chance of moving forward toward effective social justice. And there is a power in a sisterhood that runs deep. Just as we rely upon ourselves to hold and expand the space for our sisters to heal, teach, learn, and engage, we rely upon women in our movement family. I want to just make a special thank you to Lois Ahrens, who sits with us today. Lois is the only non-formally incarcerated woman that is of the core 
organizing group that created the National Council. And I want to say thank you to Lois, because when I came home from prison and thought that I had really gone mad from what I had experienced, and that I didn't think that anybody really quite understood, Lois did understand. And she has marched with me since that day that we met years ago and continues every day to help us to create the space for our voices to be heard. And I love you, Lois, and thank you. We rely upon women in our movement family, like Nikichi Taifa, like Jessica McCurdy, and Malika Sadasa, who create the access, the access, and the pathways for our work. Brilliant women with access who do not wait. Nikichi never waited for us to ask for help. She never waited for us to come knocking on that door for her guidance. But she came to get us. She came to get us in the dock and to shine the light for our forward movement. And we thank you, Nikichi. We join a long history of women who over decades of decarceration work have stood bravely and spoken truth to power, some while still chained and shackled. Women like Donna Hilton, who started her work from inside the New York State Bedford Hills Prison for Women while serving a 27-year sentence. Her New York-based project is called Candles for Clemency, and through her work and the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, we are making an appeal to Governor Cuomo and governors across this country to be bold in granting clemency to women in the state of New York and in states across this country. <laughs> women like Laura Whitehorn and Susan Rosenberg, who sits among us today, 16 years she served in a federal prison, and the organization Release Aging Political Prisoners, RAP who work to free political prisoners and remind us every day, despite the efforts to disappear them within prisons, that they exist. And I thank you, Susan, for your work. <laughs> Women like Vivian Nixon, the incredible fight that Vivian took on and never wavered from, understanding the absolute incredible importance of bringing education into our prisons and, our, and providing access, access to education to people while they're incarcerated and access to education for people once they have come home. And I thank you, Vivian, for your power in that landscape and I thank you for that work. Women like, women like Topeka Sam, who being home less than a year, Topeka Sam has transformed how we raise awareness, bringing the people to the policy and expanding the use of voices of formerly incarcerated women and girls, not just to talk about the messy parts of our lives that have brought us to a prison bunk, but to talk about using our voices, our expertise from our experience, and how to shape and inform more effective policy. I am proud to be a member of the council with you, Topeka Sam, and thank you for your work. I'm almost done. <laughs> almost. And women like Amy Pova, who never stopped fighting for her freedom. After nine years and three months on a 30-year sentence, she was granted clemency by President Clinton. And since walking out of that prison on July 7th, 2000, Amy has kept her promise to never, ever forget the women that she left behind and has dedicated her life to an organization called Can Do Clemency. Half, half of the 63 women 
not enough, that have been released through President Obama's clemency project, half of those women were on Amy's list. And they are women, they are women like Ramona Brandt, who just 11 months ago sat in a federal prison, going on her 21st year of incarceration on a sentence of life with no parole. When you hear Congressman Booker speaking about the victims of our policy and our sentences in this country, he is speaking about real people. In December of 2015, Ramona, stand up please, Ramona. <laughs> Ramona received clemency from President Barack Obama. She came out of that prison and she never lost hope during the entire time that she was in prison for decades that she would be able to walk out of that prison. And she did after serving, a, a, after being sentenced to a life with no parole sentence. If you look around you, you will see on these chairs the women just like Ramona. Ramona's picture is the first picture in that chair. And we keep it with the rest of the women that right now today will stay in prison for the rest of their lives for nonviolent drug offenses if we do not take action to bring these women home before the end of the Obama administration. Please help us. I want to say thank you to the woman who took care of us so much while we were in prison, who decades after decade, women, young women, young women, who came through that prison system in the federal system were greeted and met by Ms. Phyllis Hardy, the matriarch of our organization, and were taken care of, and to help all of us to get through the time that we spent. After 23, after, after 23 years in the federal prison system, we finally brought our matriarch, Ms. Phyllis Hardy, home. And we love you, and we are glad that you are here with us today. In closing, I would just like to leave you again, please, asking you to help us. We will continue our work, regardless, regardless of what we are up against, regardless of what administration is in office, regardless of who else is happening or what else is happening in the world, the National Council, we will continue our work. We need you to help us, please, to do and do your part. You know this is wrong. You know that there is an injustice happening in this country, and it is only those of you who will help to bring it to an end. And we can start by making sure that all of these women whose faces that you see in these chairs are able to come home to their families, to their communities, and start their lives over. Thank you.